How is everyone today? Blessed. Good. Amen. Well, I don't want to create any false expectations, but I'm very excited about today's message, especially in light of, you know, what the songs we were singing, the testimonies we had, the word pastor gave, and nobody knows what my message is about today. So if you've got your Bibles, let's go ahead and open up to Mark chapter 4. And now this is, it's a familiar passage, and um, we, we've all read about it, we've all known it. It's when Jesus calms the storm. Amen. But as I was reading over this, there's some things that just jumped out at me, some things that I hadn't seen before. And, and I think you're going to love this. And, and, you know, the last few times I've preached, and this is continuing in that same line, amen, talking about attributes of God. And the fact, Pat, I can speak in tongues too, amen. So the past few times I preached, we were talking about, um, we would name an attribute, of God, that's what we were talking about. And, and when I'd use a story or something to, to help bring the point home, and the first week, if you remember, I know it's been a few weeks, and if you hadn't seen them or you forgot, they are online. Go back and watch them, but it was called Enjoy the Ride. Enjoy the Ride. And if you remember, I told you a story about how I was rappelling off a mountain, and I clipped a little boy on behind me. And he was, he was little, three, four, something like that, maybe five, if that much. And, and he was hanging on to my belt, and I related how that experience, that he was just enjoying the ride. And I related that if we knew how strong and able and capable God is, we could just sit back and enjoy the ride. We really could, amen. And then uh, the next week I talked about, the title was, I Will Arrange It. And if you remember me, now that, that, that was a tearjerker. I mean, that got to my emotions. But it was based on a true story about this father at the end of World War II, and he took his daughter to the orphanage, remember? And the orphanage wouldn't receive her because the, or, the, the, the director of the orphanage said, she's got you, her dad. He goes, well, I can't take care of her. And he says, well, we can't either. She's got a dad. And the guy picked, her, pick, picked his daughter up, gave her a hug, put her in the arms of the director of the orphanage, and he says, I'll take care of it. Take my daughter. And he went out and he killed himself. In order for his daughter to be taken care of. This was post-World War II. There was nothing for him to do. He had no hope. But you know what? Jesus did the same thing for us. He took care of it. There was no way for us to take care of our situation from God. And Jesus went out and took care of it. Did he not? So today, we're going to be talking about Beyond You. That's the title of today's message, Beyond You. Amen? So, in, in, in the topics, the attributes of God that we're going to be speaking about today and this is what I love. It was so beautiful. The whole service up to this point has gotten us here. We're going to be talking about the sovereignty and the faithfulness of God. The sovereignty and the faithfulness of God. So if you didn't already open your Bibles, open your Bible. We're going to read in Mark 4, and we're going to start in verse 35. Mark 4, 35. And it says, as evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus, where was Jesus? It says, Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. Another version said, with his head on a pillow. I don't know about you, but I love that that is in Scripture. Jesus was laying on his pillow. Sleep is scriptural. It's biblical. It's spiritual. Amen. <laughs> All right, let's keep going here. And it said, the disciples woke him up shouting, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? How many times have we been in the, had those same thoughts? Been in some situation and we're shouting out, Lord, you don't care? Come on, God, you don't care what I'm going through? Or am I the only one? Right? Verse 39, when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? You know, we read on other occasions when Jesus, when Jesus called out or rebuked or got on to his disciples. 
And he, and he always said to them, why do you have little faith? But this time Jesus says, why do you have, do you still have no faith? I never saw that before. We're going to get back to it, okay? Verse 41, the disciples were absolutely terrified. Who says amen? <laughs> Matthew and Luke used the word, they were marveled. And then continuing on, it says, uh, who is this man, they asked each other. Even the wind and waves obey him. Who can this be? Who is this? So point number one is the answer to their question. Point number one, he is the sovereign Lord of the universe. That's who he is. That's who Jesus is. And that's why the wind and the waves obey him. He is the sovereign Lord of the universe. Now, let us define a little bit the word sovereign because we all know what it means. We have an idea of what it means. But I want to I dig a little bit deeper there because um, I'm going to be honest with you. If you look up the word sovereign, if you, you go online, you look it up, or, or you have your strong concordance, the word sovereign does not exist in the King James Bible or in the New King James Bible. It's not in there. So why do we say that? It is in the New Living, Living Translation, and, and it does appear in some newer translations. And, but the reason that the word sovereign was not used in these older translations is because there is not an actual Hebrew or Greek word to translate that, to translate the idea of the word sovereign. So when the New Living Translation came along and they're, they're doing their translation and they use the word sovereign, uh, for example, in the, in the New Living, it says, or I'm sorry, um, in the King Jimmy, King James, hallelujah, it says sovereign Lord. The word for that is Elohim Yahweh. That's the best my Hebrew gets. And the New King James, it says Lord our God. So here we have a verse. It's a verse that, that we often use to say God is sovereign. Jesus is sovereign. He is the, the ultimate ruler. Amen. But it's not the word that they think. It's actually a phrase. So we use one word, sovereign. But in the Hebrew and the Greek, they use a phrase to get that idea. Are you with me? Not really. Don't worry. You don't have to be just yet. I'm planting some seed, and we're going to get to it here in a minute. It's all going to come back, all right? So if you got your Bibles, you can flip over to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15. And I'm going to read this actually from the New King James. And it says, Which he will manifest in his own time, he who is blessed and only, potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And I know I probably slaughtered that word, but I would read it in Spanish, and I apologize. Potentate, here, that word... Potentate means all-powerful. It means God is all-powerful. This refers to the omnipotence of God. God is all-powerful. Are you with me? We're just laying some foundation here. Don't, don't try to figure out where I'm going. Just, just take it in, all right? So the next phrase is what actually speaks about the sovereignty of God. Whenever we're reading there in Mark, and the next phrase, we've all heard it. We know it very well. And it says he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's over it all. That is where we get the word sovereign, okay? So Jesus is sovereign. That's who he is. Jesus is sovereign. Are you with me? Whenever you're sovereign, sovereign means God is the supreme ruler of the universe. Are you with me? All right, but y'all, did I lose you or y'all half asleep? If you're not with me, say no. Let me know you're here, all right? But if you're with me, say, ah, oh, we're following you anyways, all right? So God is the supreme ruler of the universe. That's what sovereign means. There is no king above him. There is no Lord above him. We get the word sovereign from the Latin word supremus. Now, I don't know why, but when I think of supremus, I always think of Pizza Hut, right? Supreme pizza. That's all my dad would get when we were kids. It's the best of the best. So we get the word sovereign from the Latin word supremus. Sovereign is not just the, the, the best leader. God is the supreme leader of every supreme leader. He's the best of the best. Amen. He's the king 
of kings. He's the sovereign of sovereigns. Are you following me? He's the big guy. He is above every leader, every government. Now, here's another point I want to make. Every ruler on earth, anybody who's ruling on earth, whether it be, whether it be a pastor, whether it be a president, whether it be a dictator, whoever is leading, every ruler on earth gets their right to rule through one of three options. Delegated power, bestowed power, or besieged power. One of three ways. Delegated power is kind of like what our governmental system. We take a vote and we say, hey, this guy's going to be our president or this guy's going to be our delegate in Congress. All right? Or it's bestowed upon them. How can it be bestowed upon them? Well, there's a king. He has a kingdom. He has a kid that comes along. When daddy dies, who becomes a king? The prince, it's bestowed upon him. Or maybe, maybe your boss bestows power upon you. They say, hey, I'm going on vacation. When I'm going on vacation, guess who's in charge? It's you. It's bestowed upon. It's given to you. Amen. And the third one is besieged, which means you go out and you fight for it. All right. One, those are one of three ways. And there might be another one in there, but I really I haven't found it. One of three ways rulers receive their power. It's either delegated, bese- uh, bestowed, or besieged. But you know what? Not Jesus. Not Jesus. Jesus is absolute, rightful, and creative power. Power, in other words, he has absolute power. Jesus doesn't get his power from anyone. It was created through him, the scripture says. He has the power. He is the power. And he is a sovereign Lord of the universe. He answers to nobody. Jesus answers to nobody. You could say God, but you know what the scripture says? The Father and the Son are one. They answer to each other. Now, here's the the good thing. And, and, And... If we didn't know that God was good, we could have a problem with him being the sovereign, the Lord of lords and the king of kings. If God wasn't good, if Jesus wasn't good, power could go to his head and we could be in a bunch of trouble, couldn't we? But the good news is he is good. And it doesn't get to his head, amen? God is kind. We know God is kind. God is love. God is faithful. We know that God is merciful. And we know that God is full of grace. So it's okay that he doesn't have to answer to anyone. Are you following me? All right. I'm getting somewhere, I promise. Just take it in. But here's what I saw in Mark 4 that I'd never seen before. In Mark 4, verse 35 In Spanish, it says in the same day, but it says, as evening came, so it's in evening. Jesus, they're out on the boat, big storm comes, but as, as evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. Now, it's important, and I'm going to get to that why here in just a second. But watch this phrase. And verse 36 says, So they took Jesus in the boat and started out. They took Jesus. How do you take something? You you grab it and you go, right? You take it. It I, I don't think they like tied him up and handcuffed him. You know, they might have grabbed his hand and led him on the way. There might have been, you know, five of the pot. There's thousands of people out there, all right? Jesus has been preaching all day. And they might have had to, like, you know, have a group of bodyguards around him and busting the way open. So Jesus, they took Jesus and got in the boat. Now, I think it's strange. Why did they have to take Jesus? Why did they have to take Jesus? We need to go back and look a little bit about what's going on that day. Like I said, Jesus has been teaching all day. All day. And it wasn't in a nice air-conditioned building. It was by the sea. And I tell you what, folks, I lived nine years by the sea. 
And the sea is awesome when you're on vacation. But when you live nine years by the sea, and there's not any air conditioning, it's hot. It's hot. And Jesus has been out here by the sea preaching all day. It's probably been warm. It's been warm or it's been cold, one of the two, right? There's been sun beating down. It's been a long day. And Jesus, it says, uh, he taught by parables because that's the way the people could understand. Amen? We're not teaching anything new here today. This isn't, don't worry, I'm not trying to scare you or take you someplace we don't know. He's, it says he taught by parables because that's the way people could understand. They couldn't understand if he just came out and talked to them. He had to teach them by parables. Now, I don't know if Jesus had all these parables planned out or if he just came up with them on the spot or, or what he did. But here it says, Jesus would say, the kingdom of God is like, and he'd say, a, a mustard seed. And then he'd tell the story about, you know, how it's like a mustard seed, trying to help them understand the kingdom of God. And he'd say, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed seed or, or, or the kingdom of God is like a man who went and found a pearl. And he's explaining to the people. And here's what's amazing to me. If we back up just a few verses and we read what's going on, we know that Jesus had taught all day, but we're going to see what Jesus did every time he found himself alone after he'd been teaching the whole day. In Mark 4.10, it says, Later, when Jesus was alone with the 12 disciples and with the others who were gathered around, they asked him what the parables meant. Jesus had been out preaching all day. And after he's been out preaching all day, what's he get to do? He gets to go home with his buddies. They go to their campfire. They're sitting around, and he gets to explain it all over again. Pastor Pam, how do you like preaching on Sunday morning? And then somebody coming up and say, I just need, I need a word. <laughs> yeah, right? It's on video. <laughs> Jesus couldn't say, go hit play. Go to YouTube. You know? I need, what, what did I just do? Oh, I need you to explain it to me. What, you may think, Pastor James, you're just preaching some pretty simple stuff. I'm explaining it to you so you don't have to come up to me at lunch and say, Pastor James, what was that? Now, if you're going to invite me out to lunch and pay for it, I'll explain it again. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen? So Jesus responded to his disciples because they asked him, he says, what does this parable mean? And Jesus responds to his disciples and he, says, he goes, you don't understand this parable. How will you understand all the other parables if you don't understand this one? And he was talking about the parable of the kingdom of God is like a man who sows seeds and then the enemy comes and sows some tares. So, so some bad weeds. He says, if you can't understand this one, how are you going to understand all the other ones? So let's jump forward a few verses now. Now we're going to read in Mark 4, verse 33 and 34. It says, um, Jesus used many similar stories and illustrations to teach the people as they could understand. What's it say? He only taught them as they could understand. He didn't go further. He didn't try to teach them something crazy and out there that they couldn't connect the dots. He taught them as they could understand. Amen. Verse 34 says, in fact, in his public ministry, he never taught without using parables. But afterwards, when he was alone with his disciples, he explained everything to them. So here we are. Let's go back to the day that Jesus calms the storm. Jesus has been teaching all day long. And he's finally done. And it's time to go home for him to be alone. And Jesus is... Jesus is explaining to his disciples what he just taught the people. He's, he's explaining it to them. And then verse 36 tells us, and they took Jesus. And they took Jesus. Let me tell you something, beloved. I don't know if you know where I'm going with this, but Jesus was tired. <laughs> Jesus was tired. Jesus needed somebody to say, guys, get me out of here. He said, he said, Guys, let's go to the other side of the lake. Let's get in the boat. And they go, oh, Jesus is tired. So they took Jesus. He was tired. He was so tired they had to take him away. I've taught all day. I've been, man, I, 
I, I remember one day we we got invited to a uh, to, just to go enjoy this outdoor crusade. And when they found out that I was there and I was a pastor, they invited me up to speak. And I said, ah, oh, praise God, this will be good. Well, because I wasn't on the original agenda, I got pushed back somewhere later in the day. And it was hot. And those preachers, man, they were in ties and, I mean, a full suit vest jackets out in that Caribbean sun and I'll never forget I remember I walked in and one of them he's sitting down like this and his wife's fanning him and she's going and he's and I just thought to myself take off that tie brother Jesus is going to be okay with it I've taught all day I've gone to pastors conferences I've been in places like that and let me tell you after you've been on your feet all day you don't have to be a teacher. How many of you work? After you've been on your feet all day, and man, if you work out in this Texas heat, you know, Jacob, whoo, up on top of those roofs, working on air conditioners. Oh, when I get home, bye. <laughs> don't call me. Don't text me. Right? Or am I just am I the only one? I want to rest. Leave me alone. Don't ask me questions. Hadassah runs up to me. Daddy, 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 daddy. I said, baby, let me cool off. I need to rest. Now I know the Bible doesn't say Jesus was tired. It doesn't say, well, Jesus was tired, so the disciples packed him up in a boat and took him away. But it does say he was tired. Because what's the first thing he does when he gets in that boat? <laughs> he goes and finds that pillow. Jesus went and found that pillow. He goes to sleep. Now you say, oh, that's Jesus, the son of God. He can deal with anything. He was 100% God, but you know what? He was also 100% human. And he got tired. As God... God never sleeps, but as a human, Jesus got tired. He got sleepy. He got hungry. He got hungry when I would have gotten hangry. Forty days fasting in the desert. And the scripture says he was hungry. He wanted something to eat. I'm telling you, I would have been hangry. So Jesus had human feelings. He had human nature. Things affected him the same way they affect you and me. Oh, he's a son of God. That's why he never sinned. Jesus was tempted the same way you and I were tempted. He was 100% human. Now, maybe my holy imaginations run a little wild here. That happens every now and then. And I don't want anybody to send me no emails tomorrow. Pastor James, what you talking about? That wasn't in the Bible. But I wonder, I wonder if after all day preaching... All day teaching. Jesus says, boys, get me out of here. I, I, I'm, I'm spent. So they take him. They put him in the boat. And what do they always do? They sit down and they talk about everything. But, man, this day had been a long day. And Jesus goes, oh, man, guys, I just, I just don't have it. I don't have it today. You know what I'm talking about? We've all had those days. And I wonder, I, just, man, I wonder if Jesus said, oh, Father, can you just send a big old storm, anything, a big old storm, distract these guys, get them to send a well, I don't care, whatever. I just need some downtime. You know what I mean? Or am I the only one who has kids and I got I'm like, oh, Jesus, pray and help me, Lord. And then all of a sudden a grasshopper comes along and all four of my kids are like chasing a grasshopper. I'm like, thank you, Lord. I don't know why they chased a grasshopper today, but thank you, God, you know. Anybody identify with me? Maybe it's my holy imagination. Like I said, it might not have happened that way. But all of a sudden, this storm pops up. And they wake Jesus up. Now, once again, my holy imagination here. I know Jesus is 100% God, but he's 100% human too. I don't know about you, but when I'm taking my afternoon nap, those few days I ever get to, oh, I hate it when they come in and they yell, Daddy! Or Pastor Brenda comes in, James. I imagine Jesus kind of woke up a little bit cranky. 
He doesn't get hangry. But, man, you mess with his sleepy time, he might get cranky. You know what I mean? And I bet, I imagine, this is me imagining, all right, holy imagination, don't, don't send me emails. But if somebody comes and yells at him, Lord, what do you, you don't care that we're going to drown? I mean, they weren't over there. Hey, Jesus, you know, you know like Obadiah, he's a baby. When I wake him up, I got to rub his back and then his feet and his leg. You know, it takes a while. I don't think James was over there going, well, Jesus, you know, time to wake up, buddy. We got a big storm outside. I think we're all going to drown. You want to come help us? No. Lord, come on, man. We're dying. And you don't even care. You're back here sleeping. Once again, I might have a profession as a movie writer one day with my imagination. But Jesus got up. And when he got up, you know, like I said, he may, he may be a little cranky. And thank the good Lord he didn't yell at the disciples. What did he do? He went out and yelled at the storm. He said, shut up. He said, silence and be still. Now, in the, word, in the Greek, the word, the word used there for silence is phemo. And phemo actually means the, the closest translation is a phrase, and it means to put a muzzle on it. All right? So Jesus goes out. He's upset. He's tired. He's upset because they just woke him up. And he goes out and he goes, put a muzzle on it, Storm. Shut up. I'm tired of this. Stop. I know nobody here said that. But Jesus stands up in the boat and he says, shut up. That's enough. I'm tired. But how could he do that? By what power could Jesus do that? Because he is the sovereign Lord of the universe. He's the supreme ruler. He's over it all. He is sovereign. So I have a question. Why would you ever worry when the supreme ruler of the universe is your father and he's in the boat with you? You follow me? Why do we worry? It's easy for us to read that and go, and them disciples, they didn't have, Jesus said, why do you still not have faith? You don't have faith. Ooh, be careful before you cast that stone, my friend. Because Jesus is in the boat with us. I'm not saying don't go wake him up. I'm not saying don't cry out. But there's more to the story. Amen. You know, I know I've shared this story in the past where we were in the DR and, and, and I was out inviting people to church and, and, and that one day I, I walked up on that group of drug dealers and they threatened to kill me. Kind of, sort of. I walked up and when I realized, I realized they were drug dealers when I walked up and I go, oh man, I'm not supposed to be here. And uh, they told me, they said, hey, what are you doing here? And I said, hey, I'm, I'm the pastor of the church up here, and we just want to invite you to our church because there's a good pastor. I let them know it's a pastor. Amen. Don't kill the pastor. And um, God frowns on that. <laughs> FYI, in case anybody was having any thoughts. And they said, all right, well, thank you. You need to get out of here. Thank you, Jesus. I survived. I'm leaving. And then when I'm backing up to leave, because I wasn't going to turn around, I'm not going to give them an easy shot. I'm backing up. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I told you to pray for everybody who you give a, a flyer to. And I said, Lord, these guys are animals. Ain't no way. They'll kill me. And it's one of them times when the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And I go, all right, well, I guess I'm going to die here, but okay. And I stepped back up, and those guys said, what, you didn't hear us? We told you to get out of here. And I said, well, before I go, I want to know, can I pray for you? And I've told this story before, but everybody drops, dropped their two knives and put a gun away. And these hardened criminals who were wanting to kill me 10 seconds ago, three of the five start crying, have tears coming Pray for me that I can get out of this lifestyle. Pray that my kids don't have to go through this. Pray for my mama because she's sick. 
And I don't, I don't remember the words I prayed. All I remember thinking is, don't close your eyes because they might kill you. Don't close your eyes because they might kill you. But Jesus did something in their hearts. You know, later, a few weeks later, I'm walking through that same neighborhood, passing out flyers, inviting people to church. And sure enough, this guy starts following me. This neighborhood's known for, um, uh, they, they really couldn't kidnap me. Robbing, I guess, robbing people. They kidnap most people, but they'd have a hard time carrying me off. Um, but um, they, it's known for that. And I saw this guy's following me. And, He's following me for several blocks, and I turn left. He turns left. I turn right. He goes right. Like, oh, man, he's going to try to rob me. I didn't have anything on me, but still, I didn't want a gun pointed in my face. And I go, Lord, what am I going to do? Well, I remember my little gang member group down here. They're always in that park. I saw them all the time. Every Saturday, I went out. So I just went by over there. Hey, guys, how you doing? Like, all right, Lord, what now? Hey, Pastor. I'm not stopping to talk to him, but I don't know what to do, and I keep walking. And sure enough, a few minutes later, I hear him whistle, and I turn around, and they look at that guy who's following me, and they go, like that, and he quit following me. He is a sovereign Lord of the universe. God will use drug dealers and gang members to get his love out into the world. He's sovereign. These guys threatened to take my life a few weeks earlier, and now they're protecting my life. That is a sovereign God. Amen? So point number one, God is the sovereign Lord of the universe. The good news is that was half the message. Amen. We're still going to get out of here in time for lunch today. Point number two, he is faithful and true. God is faithful and true. And I want us to read here in Revelation verse 3, chapter 14. And remember, this is Jesus speaking in Revelation 3, 14. And it says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness. Revelation 19, 11 says, Then I saw heaven opened, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True. And here's the reasons why I want to show you these verses, especially where it says, he, the part that says, He is faithful and true, the word true. If we define the word faithful, you know what it means? Full of faith. I told you this ain't hard, folks. I'm not trying to trick nobody. Faithful is full of faith. Amen? It's that simple. But what is faith? Well, faith is the evidence of things hoped for, not seen. The root of the word faith is trust. In other words, when we say put your faith in Jesus, we're saying put your trust in Jesus. And the root of the meaning of the word trust is truth. If someone is not speaking the truth to you, they lose your trust, right? They're not trustworthy. How many of you ever gone to buy something? Used car? Anybody? We already got our stomach in knots. Why? Because we've heard them stories about used car salesmen not being the most truthful. If you're a used car salesman, I know you're different. Amen? Talking about the guy down the street at the Ford dealership. But you're trying to buy something, and all of a sudden you realize this salesman's lying to you. You go, oh, man, this thing's got brand new tires on it. He kicks them. They look pretty. And as you're walking around, you go around back, and right down the middle of that back tire, it's missing a big old piece of tread. Well, I don't know if you knew this, but when they manufacture tires, they don't make them missing a piece of tread, right? And you go, man, this guy's lying to me. Now, everything he's told you and everything he's going to tell you, you have doubts. Why? Because he proved he wasn't trustworthy. When this happens to me, a lot of times I walk away from, I, I don't even go back to the company if I can keep from it. Why? Because they proved that they weren't trustworthy. If they're lying to me about one thing, they'll be lying to me about another. 
Beloved, the reason we can trust God is because he is true. He is faithful and true. God is full of truth. Amen. You don't have to turn here, but in Numbers 23, 19, write it down if you're taking notes so you can go back and look at it. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man, so he does not lie. Titus 1, verse 2 says, this truth gives them confidence that they have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. Hebrews 6, 18, it is impossible for God to lie. That's why I want to teach on the attributes of God, because the more you know him, the more you can trust him, the more you can relax. You know, last night I was talking to my brother-in-law about a, a particular preacher, a very well-known preacher. I said, well, what do you think about him? And he goes, oh, and I could tell right off the bat, he was, oh, I love him. That guy's good. He goes, I go, let me rephrase my, my statement. I go, like everybody, I know he's got some things I may not agree with, but what do you think? And he goes, man, I like a lot of what the guy has to say, but he said enough weird things enough times that any time I hear something from him, I take it with a grain of salt. Why? Because in my brother-in-law's eyes, this preacher hasn't proven himself trustworthy in all things. He goes, anytime I hear something from this guy, I have to go study and verify it. I don't take it at face value. On the contrary, he has another preacher in his life. That, that preacher rarely does my brother-in-law go and investigate what he says. Only when he hears something goes, wait a minute, that might not be right. I wanted to go check. Why? Because he has proven himself trustworthy. My brother-in-law can trust in him. The more we know God, the more we hear and we see and we experience how true he is, how faithful he is, the more we can trust him. The more we can relax, the more we can enjoy the ride. Amen? Because God is a good God, and he's always, always, always going to be faithful, and he's always, always, always going to be true. Amen? It may look different than we think, but he's always faithful, and he's always true, and those are two non-negotiables. Well, I don't understand. I'm kind of getting off my notes here. Beloved, we don't have to understand. He is always faithful, and he's always true. Many of you know my story. I'm adopted. My biological father, or and my, my biological parents were divorced, and my stepfather, the man who raised me and later in life adopted me, I remember he, my hero, I love him. He's got his faults. If you don't believe me, ask my mom. She knows a few more of them than I do. But I remember when I was a kid, before my daddy came into the picture, I, I vividly remember pulling up to the house when we were kids, and I'd ask mama, Mama, did you check the mailbox today? I'm supposed to be getting a, 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 a deck of cards. I'm supposed to be getting a birthday card from my biological father. I talked to him on the phone last week. He told me he was sending it. Mama said, yeah, son, I did, and it's not here. Some days she'd say, no, I'll have to go check, when, when, but let's get you in bed first. She'd already checked the mail. She knew he hadn't sent anything. I always remember crying because I couldn't believe he didn't fulfill his word to me. And I, I, I remember one time and I told my mama, I said, Mama, it's a deck of cards. He worked in an airline, and this was back when the airlines gave you a deck of cards, playing cards. Y'all remember that? It's been a long time ago. I said, it's a deck of cards. Why couldn't he get it? He wasn't a truthful person. And I grew to understand he wasn't ever going to be truthful with me. But my daddy, 
the guy who raised me, he never lied to me. Probably should have sometimes a few of the things he told me. You know, my dad's got a past. And whenever he started telling us kids about his past, my mama said, Charlie, you can't ever talk about that anymore. Right? And now I tell my kids a little bit I know about their grandpa's past. And Gideon goes, people sold drugs? And I go, yeah. And then my dad's like, why are you telling the boy that? And I go, it's beautiful testimony. Are you still selling them? No? All right. Praise God. He'd never lied to me. And if he couldn't, he, 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 and if he couldn't fulfill what he said he was going to do, he told me about it. Son, we were going to try it. It didn't work. Sorry. What'd he do? He proved himself faithful. But you know more than that? Our kids see us as God. They don't say it that way, and we definitely don't say it that way. But we are God to our kids. They don't know him yet. They know him through us. If they know anything about God, it's through what they learn through us. And he taught me that God is faithful and God is true. Even when it ain't pretty. <laughs> he taught me about the character of God. Amen. He introduced me to Jesus. You know, one of the beautiful things about accepting Jesus in our heart, becoming a Christian, is the more I get to know Jesus, the more I realize Jesus has never lied to me. Jesus never lied to me. I wonder, if, you, if Jesus lied to you, do you mind raising your hand right now? Jesus never lied to me. Well, he lied to me. He said he was going to take care of me, and this bad tragedy happened. We don't understand it. But Jesus never lied. Jesus has always been faithful. He's never let me down. Even when I thought he was letting me down, he was not letting me down. Why? Because he is faithful and true. That's what we're talking about today. Jesus is sovereign and he's true. He is faithful and he's true. You know, I used to live in Durant. When I moved out of my parents' house, I moved up to Durant, or Durant, as they say up there. You know what? All I wanted to do, I wanted to go to church, serve in my church up there. I was in a good church. I found me this girl. Whoo, she was a cute little thing. Not near as beautiful as my wife, right? I wanted to settle down and have kids. You know what? But what happened? God began to move in my life. God was probably talking to me, but I really probably wasn't listening the best. And God has a way of getting our attention. Why? Because he's faithful and he's true. Before you know it, I lost my job, and I had a good job. I was making nearly $500 a day as a 19-year-old kid. I didn't know how good I had it. And I go, ah, I lost that job. I'll find another one. <laughs> not when God says you're not going to. Couldn't afford to go to college anymore, so I had to drop out. After a long time, I finally found a job as a cashier at a grocery store. I was the only male cashier. And I remember, I remember this guy came in one day. He goes, what are you doing back there, boy? That's a woman job. And, man, I, was, I went from making $500 a day to making $35 a day. I didn't make nothing. Maybe I'd get 20 hours a week. I went from having a lot of money. I had a vehicle. Now, I, my grandpa gave me $1,000 to buy a vehicle and because I was making such good decisions at this time in my life, right? I went out and got another vehicle that I couldn't afford, use that as a down payment. You know, that was, that was a good moment. And then that ended up getting repoed. Another story. I went from having everything good See, I started inviting friends over to my house because I was the only one that had an apartment. All my other friends still lived with mom and dad or something like that. Yeah, come on. And, hey, when you come over, grab a pizza. Or, or oh, your mom makes a good case. Just bring some food with you because I couldn't afford it. And even though nobody knew what was going on, 
within me, I felt like I was prostituting my life and my house just so that I could survive. Because had I not done that, I don't know how I would have eaten. And as you can tell, eating is kind of important to me. People would say, man, you lost so much weight. How do you do it? And I go, I just working a lot. Man, you need to buy some new clothes. They don't fit you. Well, I still need to buy new clothes because they don't fit. But that's a different reason. I felt like I was prostituting my life, my house, just so I could survive. It didn't feel like things were going good. I was going to church. I love Jesus. I was an assistant youth pastor at this time in my life. So after time, I had no choice. I had to move back home. I just couldn't afford it no more. I couldn't fake it no more. It's more what it was. And right before I moved home, I had the opportunity to go to seminary, and, and my life was forever changed. I had an amazing encounter with God while I was there. Um, and, and, and because of that experience, I'm where I'm at today, serving God in the capacity I am. Because it was through that experience that I learned that there was so much more for me to be living for than what I was just doing. But I had to go through some pretty uncomfortable stuff to get there. Maybe God was speaking to me. Maybe he wasn't. But you know what? I know I needed to pass through that process in order to get where I'm at today. Did Jesus abandon me? Nope. He was faithful. Matter of fact, the scripture says he was guiding my steps, leading me along the best, the best pathway for my life. What do you mean? I literally felt like I was prostituting my house and everything I had just in order to survive. Jesus wouldn't make you do that. You know what? The scripture says he leads me. He leads me. He might have had to drag me because I might be so stubborn. I don't know. But that's the path I had to go down because he's faithful and he's true. I had to go through that to get to where I'm at today. Are you following me? Let me tell you something. If you don't hear anything else I say today, hear this. God is faithful even when you don't think he is faithful. God is faithful even when you have your doubts that he is faithful. God is full of truth and he is faithful. Amen? Point number three, and we're almost done. Mark 440. Point number three is, is faithful or fearful? Faithful or fearful? Mark 4, chapter 40 says, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? In other words, their fear meter, their fear gauge on their, their, their tank in their life was all the way, that gauge was all the way to the fear side. Their fear meter was full and their faith gauge was empty. Have you ever been flooded by fear? I mean, like all of a sudden, you get that phone call. And mama knows. She, I don't know, but Lord knows how mama knows. But mama knows it ain't good. I remember the night my grandma died. I get a phone call at about four in the morning. And I look at my phone and it said, mom and I told Brenda I said my grandma died sure enough my mama's there hey James grandma died hi right, mom I'll be there soon you just you know you know what I'm saying you get this flood and it just comes over you it's a flood of fear it's a flood of oh man you get a bad report something happens your boss you were just telling us. They called you in to go to the hospital. Did you say, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus? No. He goes, oh, man, what, what happened now? Maybe you just woke up. 
you just get flooded. It happens in an instant. Instant, sorry. I know a guy. He went and bought one of those swim pools for the backyard. You know, like 15 foot around. You know, three foot high. Something just to get the dog wet, basically. But it takes off the heat of the edge of the, edge of the, the summer heat. He went and got one of those, and they got it all set up. And they decided, hey, we're going to have a pool party. None of our friends got a pool. We got a pool. We're going to have a pool party. They invited a bunch of folks over. They're grilling. They're, they're swimming. They're sitting in their lawn chairs. And there's a guy sitting outside the pool in his lawn chair and talking to, to the guy inside the pool. He goes, man, you got yourself a pool. He goes, yep, I sure did. And as he said, yeah, I sure did, he, like, went to lean back on the pool to, you know, relax a little bit, be like, yep, yeah, this, is, this, this is my baby. And when he did, that beautiful mass of a man fell on that little bitty pool structure that was not created to support his weight. And what do you think happened? It flooded the backyard as that pool just crashed down. Everybody's feet got wet. And it happened in an instant. He went from being the happiest man on the block because he was the only one who had a pool to being the saddest man on the block because he just broke his pool in front of all his neighbors. Here's what we need to know. In the same way fear can flood us, faith can flood you too. Are you with me? Faith can flood you too. In the same way, that pool collapsed and water went everywhere, and he goes, oh, man. Probably said a few other words, but we're going to go with oh, man. In the same way, faith can flood you too. Just one word from God. One word. One word. The disciples are out in the middle of this sea. Their fear meter is plumb full. By now, they're yelling and screaming at Jesus. you got to be pretty scared to be yelling and screaming at Jesus, in my book. And Jesus gets up, and what's he say? Put a muzzle on it. Shut up. And what happened? Their faith, they go, their fear went out the window. They go, who is this guy? Now they're amazed. One word. Amen? How can we build our faith? Maybe we've never seen this before, but it's very simple how we can build our faith. Hebrews 11, we're not going to read from there. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible, we call it the Hall of Faith, and it talks about all these people of faith before us, these men and women who built their faith. And it gives us keys all throughout the chapter on how we can build our faith. But I want us to look at one particular woman, and it literally shows us how to build our faith. And it is in Hebrews 11. Verse 11, and it says, By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. She judged him. Abraham and Sarah, she had a baby when she wasn't supposed to. Y'all remember this story? Scripture here says, She judged him faithful. And the, she judged him full of trust. She judged God trustworthy. She judged him faithful. Faith means judging God faithful. Fear is judging God unfaithful. Faith is judging God faithful. Fear is judging God unfaithful. And let me tell you something, beloved. You and I judge God every day. We just didn't realize it, did we? We didn't realize it. I know some people say, oh, the Bible says not to judge. No, what the Bible says is don't be judgmental or critical. But it actually tells us to judge in certain situations. It actually tells us to make wise judgments. Every day we have to make judgments. You want to get up and go to work today or you're going to lose your job? What school do you want to Send your kids to. 
make a judgment. Do I want to buy this house or do I want to keep renting? What job do I want to take? What do I want to eat? But here's what we need to know. When something happens in your life, you judge God faithful or you judge God unfaithful. We do. So once again, my question is, how can you judge God faithful more? How can we judge him faithful more often? How can we say, you know what, God, I'm going to believe you more often? You know what, God, how can I trust you more often? That's what we're saying here. Well, the scripture says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And there's two words you need to remember. Two words from God. Two specific words from God that you need to remember. You need to remember these two words. You need to remember the first word he gave you and the fresh word he gave you. The first word and the fresh word. Mark 4.35, as evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. Jesus didn't say, hey, boys, let's get in the boat and go drown. Did he say that? Nope. He had already given them a word. He gave them a first word. He said, let's get in the boat and cross to the other side of the lake. Where were they going? So when something happens in your life, you need to go back to that first word God gave you. Oh, Pastor James, I don't remember the last time God gave me a word. It, man, it must have been three years ago. What was it? Go back to that. Don't get lost in the middle of the storm. God did not send you on this journey to get you to drown. He could have killed you a million ways if he wanted to, but that's just not who he is. Amen? He sent you in a direction. If you've lost your focus, go back to the last word he gave you. Go back to that first word. Amen? He's already given you a word. If you started a business, if you moved to a new city, if you're starting a new adventure in life, if you find yourself in one of those all of a sudden moments, and you're flooded with fear, Go back to the word God gave you. If it was yesterday, last week, last decade, go back to that word. doesn't mean God hadn't spoken to you since then, but if the last one you remember was that one, go to that one. Amen? But here's what's great about God. He will give you a fresh word in the middle of the storm. He'll stand up and he'll say, Storm, put a muzzle on it. Don't mess with Melissa. She's mine, okay? Melissa, remember that word I gave you. He'll stand up and he'll say, shut up, situation. Be quiet. And with this, I'm going to close. I don't know if y'all want to put on a song or if they want to come up and play. But Several years ago, after being on the mission field for about three years, I came to a point in my life and my ministry where things were just more and more stressful. Both me and, and, and Pastor Brenda were both a little bit fearful. Every month we were going five, seven hundred dollars in debt. How can you do that? I don't know how you can and still keep afloat, but I guess when God's in the boat with you, it somehow works out. We were, it was bad. The ministry, oh my gosh. We'd get three new people and five old ones would leave, you know? And we're, are we even making a difference here? God, can we go home? God, can we go home? Didn't hear anything. All thing we heard was that first word. Go love my people. And I'll tell you what to do when you get there. What am I supposed to do? Didn't hear anything. All right, well, I 
guess I'll go back to doing what you told me to do last time. <laughs> Doesn't look like it's working, God. Doesn't feel like it's working. Matter of fact, it looks like it's doing the opposite of working. <laughs> looks like it's failing. We're fearful. If we go home now, what are people going to think of us? Because we didn't build some church empire. Will God ever forgive us for not being world changers? These were our thoughts, our fears. In other words, my insecurities were showing and growing. Also during this time, Pastor was pregnant with, with Hadassah. And that was a whole other storm in and of itself. I don't know why my wife is like she is. It's a miracle we've got our four kids. She can barely carry a baby. And man, those first three months, every week, we thought we lost Hadassah. Matter of fact, one of those weeks, the doctor said, just come in and, and we'll get everything taken care of. We will go in and he found a little bitty heartbeat and said, oh, we're going to keep going. It was terrible. It was hell. Praise God we didn't lose her. So finally the time arrived for Hadassah to be born and we decided we wanted to come back to the States for her to be born. And supposedly we were coming back just for her to be born. But in my heart, in my mind, I didn't know if we'd ever go back to the DR. Every material possession we owned was in eight black tote boxes that you get from Home Depot. I took them down with us when we moved and I packed everything up and stored it in the corner of the church in case we never went back I could go back and get it in one plane load by myself all the things our, our house stuff we gave away or we loaned until we came back our bed our stove our refrigerator everything oh no yeah, yeah, yeah I don't have a place to store it you can keep it but when we come back and in my mind I said I ain't coming back I don't know how we're going to come through this failure of my life. But I didn't think we'd ever be back in the Dominican Republic. One day I was crying out to God. And I said, Lord, this is just too much. Shouting to Jesus, are you awake? Don't you care that I'm drowning? Say, God... What you've called us to is just too big. <laughs> it's failing because it's too big for me and I'm not good at it. It's beyond me. And that's when God answered. Brought a fresh word. He said, son, it's always been beyond you. Everything you ever did has been beyond you. You just thought that the stuff you did before was you, but it was me who was doing it. And he said, it might be beyond you, but it's not beyond me. Because I am the supreme ruler of the universe. And if I call you to do it, you can do it. Beloved, if he calls you to do it, you can do it. It might be beyond you, but it's not beyond him. 